Hello, everybody. Jacek Bartosiak, Strategy and Future. And with me again is uh, Nicholas Myers. Hello, Nick. Hello. Hello, Jacek. And today we shall continue the, uh, our discussion about the Asia-Pacific, the, the Pacific strategies, uh, the US-China showdown, the world ocean against the continent, uh, however you want to call it, but basically the great power competition, uh, including the, the, the military strategies and the grand strategies of the past, and especially with the focus on Mackinder Spikeman or Speakman, depending how you pronounce the guy's name, and Kennan. And we will start with that. Nick, are we ready? I hope so. We'll see what we can do. Okay. You know, while I talk, why don't we just uh, highlight some sort of a Eurasian map or something on, uh, so that people sure. have a, a nice you close view my screen. at what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Can you authorize my screen? Yeah, I'm doing my best now. Here we go. All right. <clears throat> okay. So <laughs> this is Asia. And of course, Asia is part of Eurasia. And uh, let me recapitulate uh, my basic thinking so that we have some starting point of uh, discussion. Mm, uh, you know, following on what we discussed with Nick prior to recording today, nothing is predetermined. Nothing is, uh, is doomed or sealed forever. Things are changing. Correlation of powers are changing. But still, we want today to discuss some sort of a repeating patterns or uh, these pattern of, patterns of thinking. And of course, we will try to undermine those patterns because undermining is an epitome of the Western thinking and strategizing. It's all about asking questions and undermining the patterns so that we really have the understanding of what is going on. Uh, what we see uh, before our eyes is Eurasia and Africa. Basically, the, the thing when uh, arguably the history has been made throughout the, the history of humanity. This is the place where most people live, used to live, the, the great uh, power wars were waged. And except for the United States, this is a place where great powers of the world are. Uh, at the end of the Second World War, Soviet Union consolidated its uh, continental reach from the Pacific to almost the Atlantic, to almost to the Danish Straits and almost to the Mediterranean. And uh, this was exactly the setting when uh, George Kennan wrote his ex article, Long Telegram, which was the foundation of the Cold War strategy of the United States. And, you know, if, if we really had to summarize in a few sentences what he wrote there, it was... Uh, a sort of a description, at least as I read it, that Soviet Union being such a massive continental power uh, is uh, for, because of many reasons uh, of which today we will not have time to talk, is internally flawed. And if given time, it will collapse under its own internal contradictions. And this is why the outcome of this description, outcome of this diagnosis, was the uh, containment strategy, which uh, basically cut off the Soviet Union from the freedom of strategic flows of the, founded on the, on the world ocean and underpinned by the U.S. military and financial power after the Second World War. So U.S. and its allies... Uh, that accepted the security cooperation of the United States and the competition with the Soviet Union had access to American markets, to the world ocean connectivity, you know, to financial flows, strategic flows, of course, tra human traveling, idea traveling, data, goods, money, uh, everything that is moving. And the world ocean was the main connectivity. And that was, again, as I read it, in line with what Nicholas Spikeman or Spikeman, he was of Dutch origin, uh, was uh, po 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 positing, was postulating that uh, in Eurasia, it's enough for the United States as a major sea power to control the, th the, the thin layer of the uh, coastal area accessible uh, uh, by the sea, by the world ocean. Thanks to which uh, if you have bases there and you control the flows there, you can contain any continental power. 
And that was, of course, in some sort of a challenge to the Mackinder's concept of uh, the potential for domination of the land mass of Eurasia, which are huge, many people live there, and they were out of the game after the, uh, the World uh, Ocean Revolution, the 15th, 16th, 17th, 17th centuries, where the European sailors dom sort of seized the opportunity and exploited the new, dom the new domain of sea and create the connectivity that relatively destroyed the power, the old power, the old empires of the land masses of Eurasia. Uh, that ended up, of course, and culminated in colonization and the domination of the West in the international system. And to end <laughs> this a little bit uh, lengthy introduction, I think that those three guys' uh, thesis sort of uh, Reconcile, are reconcilable with each other. Still, it, the threat might come from the inner of Eurasia where the naval power of, for example, the United States of Great Britain cannot impose its agenda, its will. Uh, it is not, this inner Asia, heartland, is not connected. It doesn't have resources because it's far, far away from the world ocean, as Mackinder noted. But if connected, if modernized, if industrialized, it would change the game because it would be out of the reach of the political agenda of the world ocean. Uh, at that time, Spikeman thought that it's enough to control the Rimland with the coastal area. And uh, it was in line with what Kennan was writing that it's enough to create a barrier around the Soviet Union and wait, making sure that, of course, he couldn't know it at that time, that there is no nuclear uh, Armageddon happening by accident or by some sort of misperception. And that was it. And this is how we enter the, the new era of the post-Soviet post -Soviet, uh, period of time, when the United States simply moved the freedom of strategic flows inside into the heartland of Eurasia by accepting China, former Warsaw Pact countries, and for some time even Russia on some terms. And that was the victory of sort of the world ocean hegemony. Uh, things are of course changing. Everything depends most on the connectivity, technology, new sources of power. So nothing is predetermined, but that was that basically a basic picture. Nick, how would you respond to this? Uh, of course, very rudimentary and sometimes simplistic description, but maybe that would be a good, start, a good starting point for discussion. Well, it's an excellent starting point for the discussion. I think the major thing that we need to do in order to contextualize these three gentlemen from the early 20th century is that in the early 20th century, the transformation of transportation is very much making the world smaller in a way that inverses the 19th century dynamic. We don't think about it very much anymore, but the 19th century almost makes the world bigger than it used to be. Uh, the invention of coal-fired ships actually makes it more difficult to move between continents um, because, simply because you need a lot more fuel. It makes coaling stations and minor colonies much more important, even as though at the same time, the telegraph uh, linking different places by cables means that communication is moving faster. Ironically, it's not terribly dissimilar from COVID-19, where we can communicate faster and faster using the internet, but nobody can go anywhere. So you can think of it almost as, a, as, as an analogous event. When you get to the early 20th century, the introduction of petroleum fired ships, in addition to large scale rail projects finally succeeding in Africa, really opens the imagination to what is the future again for really large scale global transit. And this is what I think fires the imaginations of these three, these three people in particular so Mackinder is thinking primarily from the British civil service perspective, and he is just overwhelmed with imagining what would happen if you were able to finally build railways across Central Asia the same way that you were starting to be able to do in Africa in the late 19th century. And I, that dream really is not fulfilled yet. Uh, in no small part because the Sino-Soviet split really made building infrastructure across what's already difficult terrain out in the middle of uh, Eurasia very difficult. But even with One Belt, One Road really starting to close some of these gaps, there's a long way to go. We can imagine that if suddenly this was all an integrated realm of infrastructure, then suddenly the world might be completely reformed. 
But until that happens and until there's actual investment going on in the center of Eurasia that's causing a dynamism along the entire economic chain, I think Mackinder was um, a bit either ahead of his time or too much, so much of a futurist that it's sort of interesting to put him into a perspective of what the British Empire imagined its future was. Because uh, unfortunately at the moment, uh, when we think about how One Belt, One Road works, it increasingly looks like a series of extortion mechanisms by which different e former Soviet actors are going to get money from the Chinese trying to sell things cheaper to uh, Europe. I remember uh, meeting with some people from uh, Lufthansa telling me about how they have to pay overflight rights to the Russian Federation for every flight they take between Germany and China. And that this is quite a lot of free money that the Russians are getting off of uh, the Chinese rise of economic prowess. So until that dynamic switches, it's difficult for me to imagine uh, how Eurasia gets transformed into the Heartland thesis. Um, the one minor quibble I would have with, with your introduction is George Kennan's policies inspire US, or sorry, George Kennan's recommendations inspire US policy, but it was an ongoing decades long debate that the guy named uh, Paul Nitze, who ends up writing NSC 68, which typically gets formulated as what the actual policy of the long telegram was supposed to be in US history, actually reverses George Kennan's logic. George Kennan comes to the conclusion that, that there are, I think, four industrial zones in the world and that you, we need to prevent the Soviets from gaining control over more than what they have. The zones, if I remember correctly, are North America, Western Europe, uh, cent Central Asia, uh, Central uh, Great Russia, effectively, the area built by Stalin's five-year plans, and then Japan. I think he includes as a fourth one, though I'm, I may be misremembering that. And his conclusion was that if the United States maintains control over Western Europe as well as its own industrial zone and can keep some footprint in Asia, then they will always outmatch Soviet economic productivity. When this gets codified into policy, what Paul Nitze ends up writing into it is that effectively any piece of territory that it's not controlled by the Soviet Union is now a vital interest because we're actively trying to contain it, their expansion. And it really reverses the logic where we no longer think of the world as where is or is not a priority. It's everywhere is a priority if the Soviet Union is not there. And this becomes a long going uh, debate over the course of the late 20th century. Indeed, Paul Nitze and George Kennan both lived in, to be like 100 years old and continued to debate this themselves uh, until shortly, pretty much when they died in 2003 and 2005. Uh, George Kennan, 2003, Paul Nitze, 2005. They were very good friends, but. Um, it became this ongoing debate is are there actual priorities here or not? With Spikeman, again, the, the theory is quite interesting, but we really also need to question here, how does the definition of commerce change over time? I know, Yasek, you and I have just talked several times about how the US Navy performs an incredibly important service around the world by just keeping the freedom of commerce moving in a way that most people no longer think about. Even if they are, even if they own shipping companies, they don't think about the role the U.S. Navy plays it because it hasn't been contested in so long. But whereas in the late 1940s, or in the early 1940s, when uh, Spikeman is writing, uh, there is a considerable degree of regularity between the different ports about how commerce functions, if only because British insurance or American insurance and British or American companies are moving most of the materials around. Uh, that's really decayed over time, um, not necessarily deleteriously. In some ways, it's really increased profit margins as technology has improved, as the seas have become more peaceful than they were in the early 20th century. But we really do need to question now, what is the future if suddenly there might be competing zones of influence? If the People's Liberation Army Navy of China controls a certain section of the world ocean, and the US Navy controls all of the Western Hemisphere, for instance. How does that start to factor into our conceptualization of what access to the sea means? Because it's one of those analogies I find quite interesting when you think about 16th century Europe, 
is that if you're a European monarch thinking about exploring the grander ocean in places that you don't really have good charts for, you happen to know that there's quite a lot of money to be made out there simply through arbitrage. It's getting to trade with China and Japan. And if you can start to send uh, regular merchant forces out into the, brand, into the grander world uh, with superior technology over whatever you're going to run into, it's effectively free space. Um, it would be similar to doing something more akin to space exploration now if we knew that getting to the moon was going to get you rich. Unfortunately, it doesn't, so we're not really doing serious lunar colonization at the moment beyond government projects. But the, the point is that so long as the rules of the road are basically assumable, the US Navy is going to prevent you from doing piracy on the high seas, or your ability to carry a couple of cannons on board is going to, to prevent any other government from interfering in your grander merchant um, ambitions. In those circumstances, uh, you, can, you can make a lot of assumptions about just having access to the various ports of the world uh, being of significant importance. I'm not sure that's going to necessarily hold into the indefinite future, but we'll have to see as we go on. The last point I'll make before we, we open this up to just not going back and forth on this, is that these three theses coming in the early 20th century are really sort of the final, in my opinion, highest art of, industri of the era of industrial warfare. Uh, they really do assume that power is going to be communicated by space. Um, and I mean space in the academic sense, literal t territory or terrain. That if you're going to have a fight, it's going to be effectively linear. And even if you're in a similar situation like the Russian Civil War, you still have to move people back and forth. And we see already now that the lines are not linear in terms of political competition or in terms of commercial competition or in terms of communications and information competition. And while we still attach significant importance to physical things, the ability to move uh, manufacturers from China to the rest of the world or from the ASEAN nations to the rest of the world. This is no longer the end all be all nature of how international commerce and power I think functions anymore. And as we get further and further into the missile age um, and increasingly now the robotics age, I think that's going to diminish even further though we will have to see to what extent we get a neo-materialist re revolution in the next couple of years as uh, I think the spiritual era is coming to a close, at least by the current trends. But I'll hand that back over to you, Yas, I can see. What in particular of my ramblings make, make <laughs> No, it's, uh, uh, of course, they're very convincing. And uh, uh, I, I would also to, to, uh, would like to add two, two points to what you just said, uh, which I find very interesting, especially recently when I think about this competition between the continental land masses and the world ocean. You are, you are right that uh, three gentlemen were writing about the, the apex of the industrial age. And uh, there is a book uh, written by Alvin and Heidi Toffler, War and Anti-War, that beautifully describes the uh, three periods of development, human developments. The first one was uh, uh, where the land mattered most. This is where you were, you know, plowing the land, uh, exploiting it, and so there were huge land armies, territorial defense, uh, malaise, people were fighting on arm's length, so to speak, uh, very ferocious battle over domination of the land because the land was the capital. Then there were industrial wars, and those three gentlemen were, gentlemen were at, as I said, the, at the apex of this age. The terrain also mattered, but in a different way, not by the acres, the hectares possessed, but the critical choke points, pivotal places, the uh, critical terrain for ma war maneuvering or supply chains or choke points like Malacca or Panama Canal, right? That you needed to control to impose your will on others. And uh, Toddler was uh, right in his book that I mentioned by saying that we were entering, and now I think we are in the midst of it, the information era. When the commodity is information, processing information, collecting information, data, doing something with it, 
uh, increasingly with AI and other you know, automate, automated systems. Uh, and this is fascinating for me how the correlation of terrain and the pivotal points changes. It has not become obsolete. It, is, it still matters because the uh, undersea cables are undersea in the particular locations. Uh, the satellite launching facilities that uh, go into space and relay information to us need to be placed somewhere. Canaveral, right, for example, or uh, Guyana, French Guiana, right, in particular places. Uh, internet cables, too. Downlinks and uplinks, they also happen in physical places. But since in the, for throughout the history of humanity, transportation and information flow was the same. Napoleon, it took Napoleon 13 days to get from the Nemunas River to Paris after his uh, uh, defeat uh, in, in, Ro in Russia's campaign, because he wanted to make sure that there is no coup d'etat, because he didn't want the information to take overtake him. Uh, with the expanding of telegraph and then everything that we know today, wireless communication and so on, there is a dematerialization of information. And now we are simply pounded daily by masses of information, collection of information, images, and so on and so forth. And this is becoming a, a, a commodity that is being sold and so on. And now the question mark, how does changes the correlation of power between the continent and the world ocean? And does it consolidate and, and increase the chances for China and countries in China and Russia sort of isolated within the landmass as towards the, the, you know, the, the typical sea powers or it doesn't matter anymore? And of course, because nothing is zero sum game in this, it's all relative, those changes takes time. And how do we, assess them. It's not easy, but this is a question mark for the future in my personal opinion. So Thanks. the two dimensions to that that I think are interesting to go on from here is that in, the, in an era that we can imagine, and unfortunately it's a pessimistic era, but it's the one that I think is becoming more likely almost on a daily basis right now, talking in 2021, is that we can either think of the map becoming more important as a revenge of geography, sort of this notion of if there's going to be a breakdown in the great power uh, cooperation on commerce to the point that we may need to start having different merchant marines pick who is going to defend them or be provisional against ordinary safety concerns on the high seas, or else moving on trains between countries, then you're going to start to need to emphasize once again, the access to land borders and the access to sea lanes of communication. But the second one that's opened up by the information age is simply where data is being stored. As everybody has now gotten so used to the fact that everything is in the cloud, that we've forgotten that that data is in fact physically somewhere. And it makes it possible for several weapon systems that are now almost legacy, such as a certain nuclear EMP capabilities to simply wipe out data, no matter how safe you are physically out in the middle of the countryside away from where the nuclear weapons are going off. And a combination of those things means that some, a lot of the planning as well as the risks that can be exhibited between different actors within the system I think increasingly that's going to include a variety of private concerns in addition to states, those states are still going to be the number one players here, uh, is going to start to remake how we understand the dynamics of not only geopolitics, but just power and competition over the next century. And here we start to see some of the elementary logic of the transformations over the last couple of years. So I'll start to zoom in a bit on this map into a couple of examples. Some of the most interesting places that China, the place where China is exhibiting the greatest interest uh, in Asia, uh, before we get to broader Eurasia, are Pakistan and Myanmar. And on the surface, it doesn't 
I was sort of would think of it as uh, Pakistan is no longer nearly as enamored of the United States as it used to be throughout the Cold War. They had a huge falling out uh, over the conduct of the war in Afghanistan that has pretty much only gotten worse. It's They've managed to ignore each other into being okay with each other over the past couple of years. But you can imagine that the origins of the China-Pakistan reconciliation are Pakistan's revenge against the United States. It is the same way that you can imagine that uh, China working with Myanmar is based on the fact that Myanmar has nowhere else to go. So it's basically a free satrapy on the side. But having various uh, places that you need to pay for on the, re on the periphery of your pseudo commercial imperial system is not especially useful. This is something that Putin has learned the fun way with the Eurasian Economic Union is that he can basically get all of the economic value of the EEU members and not have to pay for their upkeep, except for Tajikistan, which has an interesting, uh, uh, interesting blackmail system as its strategy. The actual reason why they're useful is because Myanmar and Pakistan, as you see on the map, offer China a way to get around the Straits of Malacca as a potential uh, choke point for all of its trade, especially with the Middle East, for which it is dependent on getting the energy necessary for its current capitalist system. Uh, all capitalist uh, markets require a lot of energy in order to keep moving forward. And, for, and in China's case, as a lot of imports from the Middle East. And as we've discussed, I think, in our previous uh, talk, uh, the big option that was being uh, debated in the United States 20 years ago was what if the US Navy just made it impossible for Chinese shipping to get through the Straits of Malacca? Would that, in fact, actually shut down the Chinese economy in a way that they really couldn't strike back? And the answer at the time was probably yes. Uh, without any additional petroleum, the Chinese economy would start to collapse simply because no, nothing could move. And the Chinese Navy and the Air Force did not have the capabilities to stop U.S. Uh, naval capabilities that were several thousand kilometers away from the nearest Chinese base in Hainan Island, uh, which is the island here off of, the large island here off of Vietnam. And so we've seen uh, a large scale development of uh, Chinese infrastructure through Myanmar and especially through Pakistan to get around that, poten that potential choke point and offer new options to get to the Middle East. Uh, and interestingly, this is despite the fact that it's caused some severe political um, opposition to China within the Myanmar military, which sees this precisely as a way of getting in on its own sovereignty or edging into its sovereignty, as well as exacerbating Myanmar's long-standing civil uh, unrest among its various uh, ethnic minority groups. And in Pakistan, uh, where it's very much an artificial country, which a number of uh, the Muslim population from across the Indian subcontinent have been forced onto this smaller percentage of land and displaced a lot of the original populations, China's also plowing its way into a whole bunch of political instability but is effectively willing to pay to push it, to push that down indefinitely in order to keep those options open. And we need to emphasize here, if there's no realistic scenario short of China and the United States really having a falling out that makes China absolutely require having these two places within its periphery. However, if, there is, if we do get to the point, say, China strikes at Taiwan, but the Biden administration isn't going to start a war over it, but they are willing to start causing untold uh, chaos to happen to the broader Chinese commercial interests, uh, that they start needing to come up with alternatives, say, if Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia start coming to an agreement that they're not letting any Chinese ships through, and if you try to attack us, it'll be an even bigger conflict. So we start seeing all of these in uh, backup investments starting to go through in different places. That's why um, Egypt all of a sudden is once again on the map as Russia, China, and the United States are all competing for influence in a government that is not especially stable, but which is sitting on top of a very important geopolitical asset in the Suez Canal. I don't know if you want to add anything here, Yasek. 
Sure. I, I, I just uh, want to say, and that stems from what you have just described, is still the transportation, connectivity, and physical movement matters, being Suez Canal on Malacca. So this uh, dematerialization of, uh, of uh, transportation information did not directly translate into, of course, the sort of decoupling of the value. <laughs> It still matters uh, where the goods uh, go and uh, how they go and what is the insurance for those goods and so on and so forth. And uh, everything is fine in globalization because uh, this invisible US Navy presence makes sure that the insurance is low and the flows are smooth and seamless. If there is a decoupling, if there is a disruption in supply chains, if there is a great power competition, suddenly it may turn out that this uh, yard uh, called South China Sea belongs to China. And you need to pay taxes. They levy taxes on you. you. They may not even call it a tax. It might be called some, I don't know, introductory fee for entering the Chinese market, whatever you call it. Or you need to buy the, for example, Chinese military equipment if you want to trade with them. And this is how the world has been operating. We forgot about it over the last 30 years. It, it, the world had been operating like that since uh, the, the recorded first recorded history. Uh, we forgot about it because the last 30 years was a blissful moment of unipolarity because the United States was so powerful that it managed to counter any emerging coalitions that were supposed to balance its influence. And that's, that's a rare bird in the history of humanity. And uh, it was about control of every flow, financial with SWIFT and banking system, institutional knowledge, reputation, military, uh, trade, everything. I think we're gonna miss this moment very soon uh, as transformation that is happening now uh, will uh, create a lot of instability in all critical places, the so-called crossroads, geopolitical crossroads, South China Sea, Middle East, because Middle East is also about connectivity. It connects Europe with Asia. It connects the Indian Ocean and the India Pacific, Indo-Pacific theater and the trading system with the European system. It connects the world of Mediterranean and of Christianity with the world of Islam and Asia. Uh, it's, uh, you know, and of course, the, the, the crossroads is also here in Poland, where I sit now, where there is a sort of a strategic flows traverse the northern European plain uh, along the land corridor uh, from Eurasia to Europe and from Europe towards Eurasia. And um, those places and control over how the strategic flows are made. Uh, explain a lot on geopolitical chessboard of the current uh, strategic landscape. And now you know why there is a three seas initiative, why there is a 17 plus one uh, summit exactly today <laughs> as we speak, uh, and so on and so forth. Over to you, Nick. So the thing I would add here though is Oh, well, I completely agree with everything Asik says. You can imagine it also breaking down in two additional ways. First, it can get very, very vociferous. If you go back to medieval times, so for instance, I was doing some touring over in Scotland where I now live, over to where my family apparently is from uh, on the eastern part of Skye. And this sound here used to be a place where the local lord, my ancestors, would have, hold up ships for ransom that were traveling from Norway further south. So in the event of there being no rules about the international order, like the high Middle Ages in Scotland, you can have things as small as this becoming major geopolitical checkpoints. Yeah. But in addition to that, the other dimension that's starting to play out more and more these days is simple access to the market via technologies, as well as what are the new instruments by which you can implement, that you can uh, express your power. So think of it in terms of a hacker manages to get inside your computer and encrypts all of your data and says, I will give you your data back for however many Bitcoins they want. This is now effectively an old fashioned medieval geopolitical trick against individual members of the international 
international market. You're not going to die of any medical, medical illness imposed by this particular type of attack. There may, you might be, end up get, being considerably poor or have uh, s- severely reduced uh, economic stature as a result of it. But this sort of attack mechanism, which was not possible in the past without a large amount of investment into building up a rival business, for instance, is now relatively simple and we can do it uh, through a variety of different, a variety of different avenues, and so in the same way that I, I was referring to EMP a moment earlier, if you if an EMP blast goes over one of Amazon's clouds cloud stations somewhere, and it's done by a completely irresponsible, let's just say a terrorist who doesn't like international uh, capitalism, so not even a state based thing, and suddenly you lost all of your data. Again, your value to the economy might disappear, and we now looking at different risks moving in different in different manners. If I may, sorry yeah. for interrupting, but uh, uh, exactly so. Uh, I'm I'm not sure if our audience know that knows that, but I guess it was in 1858 or 1848, 49. There was a, a big, a big solar flare in the in the space outer space yes that killed all the telegraphs that existed at that time on earth of course it was an nascent i mean the information infrastructure so to speak relaying was in a nascent stage at that time if it happened today it would destroy the full communication system of our planet with everything, clouds, data collection, internet grids, electricity grids, everything. That was the magnitude of this solar flare. And that shows the growth of importance of the information sharing, passing on collection we, we, we have uh, talked about. Nick, over to you. The second thing that has me increasingly concerned right now is that the increasing automation of uh, weapon systems, in particular, like the rise of robots and so forth, uh, which are currently still too expensive, I think it, for, for them to be done on a mass scale, even by most governments, is going to start to change uh, the nature of how we think about conflict. So if you pull out a map of the 17th century's political lines of the map, both in Asia, the Middle East, and Europe, you see that they change very, very suddenly and very frequently, sometimes for completely peaceful succession issues among aristocrats, sometimes over wars. And why are they changing so rapidly? Is it because populations were moving more back then? Not, not actually. The core reason is because armies back then were pretty much capped at about 100,000 people. If you get more than that, you just don't have the administrative infrastructure to do so, to, to do anything. As robots begin to change this around, we're talking like armies the size of chads these days are now roughly the size of, if you just built an army the size, sorry, mixing up my analogy here. The size of the army of Chad, the, the country in Northeast Africa, is the size of the army of Gustavus Adolphus most of the time in the Thirty Years' War. It's completely, if you imagine the world revolving around Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden, uh, revolving around anybody who can muster the resources of Chad, and that's a lot of countries, um, suddenly we're going to get to the point where anybody can express quite a lot of power. And I think in that circumstance, we start to see uh, political machinations or political disputes being arbitrated in much the same way that the stock market is today in as much as it's done by algorithms, as opposed to actual basis and value of companies. And as we get further and further into that, as if we assume that the, um, the assumptions underpinning the international commercial uh, world began to fall apart simply because the Chinese and the United States cannot get along, or there are multiple challengers to the international system, or just a solar flare that blows up all of the infrastructure of the world, then we really start to enter the point where anything could happen and what, are, what exactly are we prepared for? And those are the things that have me most interested in finding out what are the determinants for 
who is going to have control over future disputes, uh, who actually does have trump cards to play. Now, some countries are remarkably well endowed with this. Uh, Turkey, for example, uh, is not going to lose significance uh, if the Black Sea becomes less important over time, so because the Bosporus is going to continue to be an important place, no matter, even if the Black Sea falls in importance. Uh, whereas other countries, I mean, imagine what would happen if the United Kingdom lost all of its data today because of a solar flare. I think the value of a financial market in the city is going to effectively be erased. So we may, <laughs> nuclear weapons might be the only thing the United Kingdom has left as a major uh, bargaining to bargaining chip afterwards. And it's those sorts of vulnerabilities that I think are the most interesting to talk through as we think about the future of Eurasia. And that of course requires some reference to uh, the thinkers from a hundred years ago or 50 years ago. But I think also emphasizes a point that I started to introduce last time, that these different theories we have, there would be McKinder, Speakman, uh, George Kennan's thesis on the industrial regions of the world, or the first, second, third island chains, or Asia Pacific versus Indo Pacific. All of these things move in and out of relevance over time as the different forces that are making, that are powering the economy, as well as powering uh, international political interests, uh, rise and fall in importance. I'll let you comment there. And then. Yeah, I would take it from this point by giving two examples, one from the past of disruptions and the second maybe from the future. Uh, the, the example, an example from the past is about the importance of Venice, an Italian city on the Mediterranean that uh, prior to the great ocean revolution and you know, capturing the Atlantic connectivity, it was a, a sort of a, it was in a commanding position controlling the trade, the land-borne trade from Levant and from China and India towards Europe and backwards, and also controlling access to the European peninsula across the Alps by having proper relationships with, uh, with, the, with the sort of polities in the East and the, um, the access to major ports and choke points and Bosphorus and Constantinople, they made fortunes. And for several centuries, there were the key political uh, power in Europe. And almost overnight, they were finished by creating the new connectivity. Of course, it lasted a century until the proper routes were established, the insurance were good enough and the trade was stable. There are many people that died in the process of, and we forgot their names. It was not only Columbus, Vasco da Gama and others. Uh, that escaped the Mediterranean sort of uh, containment. But Venice was simply <laughs> doomed. They could do nothing to, uh, to in, re in the relative equation of power, they were losing daily. So sometimes things happen, the new connectivity emerges and the game is over. And your location dooms you. Okay. If I remember correctly, the treaty that finally kills the Republic of Venice in Campo Formio is just such a minor footnote in history now True. for a long, glorious period of time. True. Also, suddenly, the invention of new resources like oil made the backward world of the, you know, of the Arab, Arab, Arabian Peninsula a pivotal place. Or yes. Baku a backward place in the Russian empire on the you know, sort of border with Persia became a, a critical pivotal place for the industrial age. Yeah? Oil fields of Baku in Azerbaijan. Yes, yeah, so a territory I barely remembered became a scene of the, one of the last gasps of the British German race in 1918. And everybody's trying to get to that last bit of oil that they think is out there. Hmm. History of oil is such a wild train ride. I think in the 1880s, sure. Pennsylvania provided 90% of the world's oil. And it's uh, difficult to imagine today what would happen if so, that was the case. So there are major disruptions. And imagine now the space exploration, I mean outer space. What would happen is if suddenly the Chinese made it to the moon, create a lunar mining facility, production in situ, automated, 
and the supply line from the moon, which is not far away. It's like two or three days of travel, much shorter than to the, across the Atlantic by ship. And uh, there are you know, resources there and the new connectivity. And uh, we talked about information uh, realm that it's the most, so that's the future. So information flows are perfect in space because space is void of friction. And uh, so this is the perfect sort of a domain for information flows, information collecting and so on and so forth. And also if you have enough technology, you can see here, eavesdrop over here and collect all signals on earth. Who knows, maybe this is why the Donald Trump created the Space Force. And maybe this is why Musk is dreaming about, you know, making it there and building a truck, a space truck called Starship that could really create the new connectivity in volumes and making it cheap. So who knows? There's always a revolution behind the corner or around the corner. There is always a disruptive change that is looming somewhere, threatening some interest, salvaging other interests. Everything is always dynamic, nothing stands still, everything flows, as Heraclitus used to say in the ancient times. Over to you, Nicholas. Indeed, and that's where, that's where we start to do future planning as to, or future thinking, I suppose, about what are the choke points of the future that we really need to uh, start concerning state planning as well as corporate planning and all sorts of other planning for, for right now, it can get quite difficult because any number of very real possibilities might occur, including another solar flare knocks us all back into the 19th century tomorrow. Um, my, my thoughts as we get started on further specifics, because I know we talked about the island chain beforehand, is if we discuss a bit about the enduring US strengths in the Asia Pacific region, um, I don't wanna to go too much into Indo Pacific just yet because I, I, I'm not sure it's been entirely formulated out even among Ameri in the American mindset. But we start by going through what are the enduring strengths the United States has and then to what extent they actually constrain Chinese behavior and what China has done to evade them. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, sure, let's start it. So the most obvious part, I think we even discussed this a bit last time, is that the first island chain is almost exclusively composed of US allies, uh, good old fashioned military political allies. The exception is, potentially is Sakhalin Island, which may or may not be considered part of the first island chain. I think it at least geographically is, but obviously controlled by Russia. Russian interests in the Asia Pacific are, in my opinion, different from China's, but I know many people disagree with me. Well, we start with that simple point, that at least in terms of presence and politics, China is really entering into this region at a disadvantage if it's trying to uh, not so if it's trying to either join the US led international order as being a co equal guarantor of the international commercial system, or if it's trying to replace the United States in that role, or if it's trying to carve out its own section apart from it. I think most likely it's the second of, option of those three, but I think it at least would be willing to go for the first one. Uh, the third one would be an emergency if it had to, in my opinion. So if it's going to make a move into this region, um, or if it's going to make a move that puts itself into a position where it's geographically in control of its immediate border, border areas to secure the sea line of communication of stuff coming in and out of literal Chinese ports, as opposed to first having to cross a considerable land area by rail, either through uh, Russia and Central Asia, Myanmar or Pakistan, or India, hypothetically, but that's not really going anywhere at the moment, um, then it's going to have to find a way to work out a political arrangement with the first island chain, uh, assuming that the United States is actually turned against them. Um, as I also mentioned last time, the core pillars 
for enduring U.S. access to the region have traditionally been Japan and Australia. And as I think I said last time, it's easy to overestimate uh, Japan and Australia's actual contributions to this, uh, but they are pivotal. If you don't have those two, then the United States really doesn't have much further access into the region. But as China, but we, we've seen also that the Chinese have military plan for this uh, by increasing their effective range of weapon systems in a way that really was not thought of as practical 20 years ago. In fact, even 15 years ago, um, if you read most of the literature coming from both the military in the United States and even from Russia, as well as academics at large, the thought was that uh, the former Soviet Union and the United States pretty much had a monopoly on long range missiles. And that has ended. In addition to China acquiring them, India and now increasingly North Korea, and to a certain extent uh, also, um, to a certain extent also Iran and Pakistan are also acquiring these systems that effectively mean that the tyranny of distance is still in effect, but their access with the possibility of causing all sorts of major damage is no longer um, proscripted. And indeed, with the Chinese building up so many short range missile systems, it's virtually impossible for the United States to actively plan on being able to do a saturation in the way that they, in the way that they would prefer with their own long range uh, weapon systems to inhibit the enemy from, to inhibit the Chinese military from being able to do something as they were attempting to shut off the entire flow of um, the economy through the Asia Pacific region within the first island chain. So on that front, I would say that the military angle has become more of a stalemate because these countries right off of the Chinese border are not about to start actively cooperating with the People's Liberation Army. They're all very much aware of the fact that as soon as they start doing so, they effectively become part of whatever China decides to do in the future. And that may be beneficial to them, but they don't know that. And there's a long, long line of just cultural prejudices reigning in the region against the Chinese that just make this an incredibly difficult proposition. Even in countries, as I mentioned earlier, in, like such as Myanmar, where you would think that uh, Chinese favor would be extremely welcomed uh, as an opportunity to get inside, uh, it, to bolster the legitimacy of the system and perpetuate long-term regime survival in a world uh, where a number of countries uh, are calling for the uh, military to relinquish power and basically roll over and die, uh, you'd expect them to be a bit more favorable to the Chinese uh, influence and potentially mortgaging it the future in order to stay alive today. But that hasn't been the case. Um, you see that that's not as strong an impetus in Europe, uh, especially uh, the case study I would point out in particular is Belarus where the Lukashenko regime really, really has reached out to China as a potential guarantor of, in, of independence from Russia. Um, not because they expect that the Chinese are about to have more influence than Russia inside their country, but by pointing out to the Chinese pretty much incessantly that if the Russians manage to obtain overwhelming control over all of their uh, military and political decisions, then the Chinese are going to have to deal with them as sort of the, la the last, the most westerly six oblasts of Russia, excepting, of course, Kaliningrad Oblast. And Moscow has considerably more leverage in negotiations with Beijing than Minsk ever will. So there, I think the difference between them and, say, Myanmar or the Philippines is that there is just much less cultural animus against the Chinese. Um, among the Belarusian population than there is elsewhere. Would you agree, that, Yasek, I know you're, you've been watching Belarus a bit more closely than I have over the past several years. Do, do you read Minsk's attitude towards Beijing a bit differently? You know, I, I, of course, it's, uh, it would have to be a separate long and long debate. I think that Lukashenko has been doing whatever he could to find a sort of a foot... Uh, uh, so, you know, support for his feet, okay? And he didn't want only to rely on one foundation of the foot support, so to speak. Uh, 
if my English is, is, is properly conveying what I wanted to say. And he believes in, the, for, you know, for the country like Belarus to find some sort of a, uh, a few points of support, so to speak, so that he could stand at least stably for, the, for some time. And China pro promised to provide some. <laughs> of course, to, that was tested, so it will be tested. Uh, he also wanted Poland to provide it, uh, the West to provide it, the US to provide it. You know, he would even invite the devil to provide the support for his feet uh, to survive in such um, in the vicinity of Russia. And as, as as we all know, every single politician, even a di dictator living next to the great power, wants to expand the room for maneuver, and that's why he needs to invite another player that gives him the breathing room. And that's, again, it's geopolitics par excellence, and this is what has, he has been exercising. But, um, you know, Bismarck rightly stated once that the best theater performance ends at 11 p.m. or something like that. So you cannot balance in the air, so to speak. You just need the substance to balance with or around or against it you know i mean you need to balance with something uh something of substance something that really leverage things okay and because otherwise it's only a theater performance and uh, you know and their showdown comes and then it, it shows whether it was only a balancing uh empty balancing or balancing in substance so um, at the end of the day it turned out that he is dependent upon russia of course, to Poland's dismay. That should be also the lesson for Poles that balancing is not about words. <laughs> balancing is about substance. So um, that's a lesson learned in Warsaw. Uh, but uh, in terms of the Chinese-US competition, and unfortunately we have, uh, uh, you know, we're trying to keep the, our programs uh, one hour each, so we need to you know, come to an end without even starting the proper sort of worse world-like scenario unfolding. I think that critically important is still the geography of the Western Pacific. As it, um, as Colin Gray used to say, I, I, I recall it, I am right now rephrasing it from my memory without looking at it directly, that uh, geography doesn't determine anything, but it's a screenplay. It uh, shows the main plot. Uh, of course, it doesn't decide events in the plot, uh, but it, there is a good chance that also there will be an, a cast known of actors that will be playing. Uh, and this is exactly in the Western Pacific. You mentioned Australia and Japan, without which United States is simply out of the Western Pacific. And that's, uh, this is going to be a critical two areas because Chinese are not challenging the United States militarily, openly. They simply want to initiate such an economic connectivity and cohabitation that they want both Australians and Japan be reluctant to join forces with the United States in containing China. And the question for the future and the coming future, including the Biden administration, is will this strategy be successful? This will be a major playground uh, and the battlefield of this uh, struggle. No, I, I completely agree. If we can, we can go through all of the individual pieces of the map and we'll almost certainly evince uh, something of what a future conflict is going to look like or even just a future competition. Um, my, I think I will close with this one brief comment. I know there's been a lot of griping uh, in the entire, pretty much the entire West about whether or not this term strategic competition, which uh, the Trump administration came up with for China, and which the Biden administration seems happy to maintain as it's getting started anyway, uh, does that actually mean anything if you don't attach specific substance to it? And I... I'm sympathetic to the people saying that no, you do need actual substance to it, otherwise it's just words. But part of the reason why it's so difficult to come up with more substance to it and why 
the debate, I think it's going to continue to rage almost substance free out in the public for some time, is that there's so many possible dimensions to how defense planning needs to function this way. In a manner that if we were thinking about the rainbow plans back in the 1920s as the United States, it really wasn't. We were really, really thinking about under the circumstances that diplomats create this problem, what do we do? And nowadays, it's not just the people in suits at, at these foreign ministries who are going to invent an issue for us to run into. It really is going to be a competition, uh, possibly even entirely idea-based in a way that only the Soviet Union previously understood that will cause political systems to completely change. And it really makes it difficult to think through strategic competition without coming through a lot of these details first. True, true. So maybe that, that would be a good invite to our audience to stay with us uh, for further episodes as we have just only begun the long journey of trying to understand the dynamics of the growing competition between USA and China and the role of Eurasia, the correlation between information, transportation, connectivity, land mass and sea, land power, sea power, everything that you could hear uh, during this episode. So uh, Nicholas Myers and, and uh, I promise that we will continue. Yeah, for the time being, thank you for staying with us. Uh, stay tuned, please. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.